Okay, great. All right. Hi, thanks everyone for making the time to attend our webinar today. My name is Yi Chen. I'm the founder of Yi Chen R Academy. Um, in today's webinar, we hope that we can help both parents and students navigate the career art could lead to and help them understand how to prepare for different career paths. Uh, this is our second webinar. We will be focusing on architecture and interior design. We just had our previous webinar like at three o'clock. And, um, but for this one, Lucia is, is, um, is going to be the speaker. Lucia is one of my early students. Um, 19 years ago, she was one of my best students. <laughs> and she started when she was age seven and, and she worked until like high school. And in the, in for those past 10 years, she has worked diligently. And she, she is always known what she wanted to be and work hard for it. Yeah, uh, Lucia graduated from Cornell, interior design major and went to work as a very prestigious interior design firm for three years. And last year, she enrolled in Columbia for a master, uh, master's in architecture. Um, this summer, she, is going to, she will be teaching interior design and architecture summer camps at our school. Uh, Lucia is currently very busy with her final, and we really appreciate that she even tried to make her time to share her experience with our students. And we will now listen to this Lucia's art journey. Okay, Lucia, thank you for being here. <laughs> thank you for having me. Um, let me share my screen real quick. Okay. Is that working? There we go. So hi, everyone. Uh, as, <laughs> as we just talked about, I'm Lucia, and um, I'm a former student of Ichen. And let's see. So just to give a little bit of background about me, I grew up in the Bay Area, the San Francisco Bay Area, um, very close to uh, Ichen's Art Academy. Uh, so I was living in Union City, went to high school in Union City. Um, and I so here is a little bit of a sample of some of the kind of the Chinese painting work that I did with Yichen um, many, many years ago. <laughs> I think this one was 2011 and 2008. And um, so just a couple different things of what I did back then. <laughs> yeah, and she's very good. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I think that um, when I was, you know, when I was little, I was really interested in all types of drawing and painting. And luckily, my parents enrolled me to take Chinese painting and calligraphy classes. Um, and I also did some other types of drawing and painting on the side um, in different mediums, although I wasn't very uh, traditionally trained in any of those. But overall, I did use both these, um, the Chinese paintings here, as well as some of the other work that I did uh, during that time to kind of create a portfolio to apply to college. And when I applied to college, I uh, was mostly applying to design and architecture programs. And I ended up uh, landing at Cornell for their design and environmental analysis uh, program. So uh, that was in the College of Human Ecology, although Cornell also has a very good architecture program in the architecture art and planning school. Um, but uh, for various reasons, I decided to start with um, interior design first. Um, and so I think, well, first of all, I wanted to kind of explain what the pathway to an interior design degree involves uh, or an interior design certification, because in order to practice in a majority of states in the US, you kind of need to have um, a license or you can work without a license so it gets a little complicated but you are able to work without a license but um, in order to really call yourself an interior designer it's really helpful to have a license and to uh, in order to do that it's important to go to a CIDA accredited school so that's a CIDA accredited uh, program for interior design in the U.S. and so luckily Cornell is one of them and uh, when I was there I you know, I learned many, many things. It was a four-year 
Bachelor of Science. So in addition to kind of studying design, I got to take a little bit of architecture courses. Um, I got to kind of play around in other courses that I was interested in, but ultimately I decided that design was the way that I wanted to go. Um, so I guess a little bit about um, these projects that I um, did while I was at Cornell. These were kind of more very, very interior focused projects. And we, as a school, we really focused on um, improving the human experience through design. Um, and we stressed kind of the science and the psychology behind design as well, um, looking at things like ergonomics, whether or not, for example, the uh, chair that you are sitting on is comfortable or not and fits well for the human body. We looked at things like human environment relations, kind of better understanding how the uh, environment that we, like the built environment, especially kind of impacts human well being as well as kind of uh, psychology a little bit. And then we also looked at things like design strategy and user experience, um, but all focused on kind of how the built environment can really make a better uh, experience for people. And so I think that's one of the things that Cornell's program is really good at doing, um, thinking about design strategy and kind of integrating research. Um, other interior design programs, there are so many very good ones, but some of them are also probably like more focused on kind of the maybe artistic side of interior design. And I, so I think that it's just something to keep in mind um, when you are applying to an interior design program uh, to think about what type of kind of focus you want for your experience. And even now, as I talk about Cornell, um, it, they've changed their program a little bit since I went there. Um, so we, you know, initially we learned about design more generally uh, and then we got into drawing actual spaces. So for example, this project was one that I did in my senior year uh, and we were looking at adaptive reuse of an existing building. And sometimes in our classes, we get told, you know, you have to design a, a retail space or a jewelry store or a, um, an, a health center or something else. Um, and so that's kind of uh, how they present the project to us. Um, but for luckily for this project, uh, you know, they gave us a sort of empty building and allowed us to decide what we wanted to design in it. So for myself, uh, let's see, on the bottom, I was designing a wine tasting slash wine and cheese tasting bar, as well as on the top floor, a dining um, experience. So that's a little bit about that. And, you know, so we learned a lot of different skills in terms of drawing. Uh, we learned how to draw by hand in the beginning, um, especially how to draft by hand, although nobody really does that anymore in the industry, but it's still a very, very good skill to have. And then um, over time, we learned different softwares and we learned about how to draw things like floor plans, sections, elevations, um, all of these different types of technical drawings. And so, for example, this one, is showing kind of elevation and then more construction detailing um, for how, for example, something in the interior space could be put together. Let's see. And this was um, another project that I did in my senior year where we got to do a little bit more model making. And I think, yes. Yeah. So really in terms of interior design during the summer, I got to do a variety of things. And um, I think that even though that this is very interior focused, um, you know, there are different types of internships that you could take while you are um, a student. Some of my friends have done, um, you know, more US related stuff. Some people have gone in and done um, some, some, some of my fellow student, uh, I guess, fellow classmates went and um, started doing more strategic consulting type positions, et cetera, et cetera. So even though it is a very specific degree in some senses, uh, you can do a lot, you can go down a lot of different paths with it. For my uh, experience in terms of working, my first summer, I was a research assistant and a design assistant kind of helping with a professor. Um, and so I think the nice thing about being at a school that does have a decent amount of research being done is that you can kind of, you know, uh, work with professors and um, that's, that's a really fun experience, um, as well as a very rewarding experience. And 
for the next summer, I was an intern at the school itself, kind of helping with things like rendering, um, uh, using 3ds Max and V-Ray, uh, so two different programs to kind of generate rendering. And then for my final summer, between my junior and senior year, I interned at an interior architecture firm in Austin, Texas, so quite far away. But um, the reason that I found it was because an alumni of our program uh, worked there and uh, decided to, you know, reach out to Cornell and our program and ask if there are any students interested in uh, interning. And so it was really helpful to kind of have that other alumni uh, working at the firm. Um, let's see, what do I want to talk about? Well, I think at the firm itself in the internship, um, I got to do a variety of different things. So because it was a very small uh, kind of company, it was an 18 person office, I believe. And they only had two offices. Uh, I got to do a little bit of everything from not only things related to interior design, um, but also kind of administrative work. I helped with the uh, materials library. And then, you know, when projects really needed extra help, um, I was, well, I was the only intern that summer. So I got to kind of help out with a little bit of everything. And so I definitely recommend um, doing an internship at an interior office if you decide that that's kind of what you want to do for your career. Um, I think that at a larger firm, for example, um, so I, when I graduated, I worked at a larger firm um, and their internships are, you know, more structured. They have more of a larger internship program. Um, so for example, at Gensler, the firm that I did, worked at after I graduated, you do an intern project uh, for one day a week. Um, basically your own design project. And then on other days, you tend to help with project work around the office. So I think one thing um, to keep in mind in terms of getting internships is that it's really helpful to gain um, all kinds of software skills. So most firms doing interior designs today will be looking for Revit. Um, and even though not all schools teach Revit, I think that no matter what, you should probably try to learn how to use the software on the side. I had to learn it on the side as well, um, because at my school, we mostly did uh, AutoCAD, SketchUp, and then we also learned the Adobe Creative Suite, um, which I also recommend for anyone anyway, because especially when you're applying to school, um, I think that, so when I applied to Cornell, uh, I didn't know any of the Adobe Creative Suite programs, and so I kind of had to manually kind of edit my photos in a weird, it was some random software, I don't remember what, but I would say that even if you're just looking to apply to a school, uh, I would recommend learning some of the Adobe programs in order to better put together your portfolio prior to applying. Um, and then something that I had mentioned earlier was that uh, the, the place that I had interned at what had um, some alumni kind of there already. And I would say that it's really helpful to go to a school that, um, you know, has a good alumni school relationship um, where the alumni are willing to help you out and kind of help you with getting jobs and internships. Because eventually I uh, got a, an offer at Gensler in Boston uh, where m many of my, uh, the school's form like alumni were working. So I think there was about, uh, there was quite a few of us in that office. Um, and that's part of what helped with me um, landing there. Uh, so let's see, it's typically when you do apply for a design position, you will need a resume um, and, you know, something to keep in mind is that uh, the resume is not going to be the simple business resume that you typically find, um, in, uh, but that you want to see something that looks more like a design resume. And I'm happy to kind of uh, share a screen and show my resume if anyone's interested in what a design resume looks like, um, but you'll like learn that down the line. And you'll also need a cover letter, um, so it's important to learn how to write cover letters and a portfolio both a smaller portfolio that's around five megabytes usually that you can show and share some work samples, as well as a larger portfolio for interviews. 
And, um, you know, the, well, the work that you'll put in this portfolio is not the same as, it's not always going to be the same as the work that you put in your college portfolio, but uh, it will come from the studios that you do when you're in school. And sometimes though, it is nice to put a little bit of artwork in your portfolio, even if you're mainly focused on interior design, um, because companies do like to see that you have a variety of skills. So sometimes I still put some of my art in my portfolio, uh, even when I am applying for jobs. And so, so the, at Gensler, I, um, I think I was really lucky in that I got to learn how to do a lot of different things. This is one of the first projects that I worked on. Uh, it was called the Rock Point Group, and it's a small office in uh, the downtown Boston area. And the nice thing about being able to work on these smaller projects is that uh, you get a smaller team, and therefore, as a younger, younger designer, you get to do a little bit of everything. Um, so I worked with a team. So during that time, I typically would work with senior designers um, preparing presentations with them. But then eventually, uh, we would also have to draw a lot of construction documents um, and uh, do construction administration, which actually, even though we focus in school mostly on the beginning parts of projects, like the schematic design and the design development phases of the project, uh, when you do work in the field, it's Going, you're going to spend a lot of time probably drawing construction documents and doing construction administration because that usually takes longer than the design process. So I think something that maybe people don't always realize when they are going into design, um, and I hear, heard this from some of my interior design friends, is that you know they don't really enjoy the uh, drawing construction documents. So for example, you know we would draw plans and elevations and all these types of things. So we would also draw things like details. So this, for example, is a detail of, I think, uh, one of these doors. And um, these are some other little, little details that we kind of also had to draw. And so it's just important to keep in mind that in addition to some of the more, I think, mm, what people traditionally think of it is fun, uh, we also had to do a lot of technical work. And personally, I do find the technical work very, very interesting, and I love drawing construction details. Uh, but it's just something to keep in mind. Some interior designers go on and mostly focus on things like furniture. Um, and some interior designers, as they become more senior in the company, they will really, really not do many of the construction details and they'll really just focus on kind of the beginning parts of the project where you come up with big design ideas and they do a lot of presentations and things like that. So there are many different paths to go down once you enter the workforce essentially. Um, and I think that especially in a larger, in a larger office, um, you do tend to kind of go down a certain path because I had design directors who would never do drawings. And then I had, um, and then they were project architects who are the more technical uh, roles. And they would always um, have to lead the construction documents and the construction administration parts of the project in a smaller firm. And some people do go and do smaller firms uh, or do go and create their own smaller firms, for instance, uh, and become very entrepreneurial. Um, you will probably have to do a little bit of everything. Um, so let's see, I think, so these are just some of the other projects with finished photography that I had worked on. Um, and so I think, let's see, I wanted to talk about how uh, when I was working in Boston, I had a really good work-life balance. Um, and I think that's because it's Boston. I've heard that in New York City, perhaps you might have a less of a work-life balance, but uh, so I think that the design, the interior design and architectural professions in general, um, they don't have, uh, I think you do have to work hard a lot of the time. Um, and, you know, that's one of the things associated with the field. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but in general, I think that, you know, it is, it does depend on the city that you work in. Um, and in typically in bigger cities that uh, where you work, you may have to end up working longer hours, and that's just 
part of it. Um, so in terms of getting an interior design license, um, what you have to do eventually is after you graduate from a an, an ACETA accredited program, you will um, work for a couple of years and study for your NCIDQ, which is the main exam to get licensed as an interior designer in the US. Um, and that exam, I believe, is only one weekend, um, whereas the architecture exam, as we'll learn, is I think now there's five different exams and they take a very long time. Um, but so it is short, a shorter pathway to getting an interior design degree um, for commercial work. So I think that about covers most of the interior design stuff. Um, I guess if I think of anything, I'll come back to it. But uh, now we'll talk a little bit about uh, my path to architecture. So. I decided to apply to grad school while I was working because I, I think I had always wanted to study architecture a bit and I felt that it had a greater impact on the sustainability aspects of a project. And for me personally, I think I was really interested in things like structure um, as well as uh, larger built forms um, as opposed to things like furniture and finishes. Um, so that's why it worked out better for me um, but there are plenty of people, you know, who who stay in one path or another. And in general, I would say that it is easier, you know, to go from architecture to interior design. Easier, in a sense, to go from architecture to interior designer because you don't necessarily need another degree. But because I had started off with interior design, I needed another degree in order to practice architecture. Um, so, to uh, apply for a grad degree, I had to take the GRE and prepare, you know, a portfolio along with my application. And something I think that's even more important in grad school, especially in comparison to undergrad, is that you have to really research the particular program that you're applying to very well in order to understand what types of research and different learning uh, opportunities as well as teaching styles that they have. Um, and kind of to incorporate that into writing your personal statement because, um, or I forgot what it's called. It's like a, I don't think it's exactly called the personal statement, but in any case, um, it's not quite the same as the personal statement that you write when you apply to college, especially in the common app, or um, if the UC system hasn't changed their, this was many years ago, but I think I applied to, didn't I apply to, College, I think 2011. Um, so yeah, so I think that the uh, this person this statement uh, is a bit different because you're really focusing more on you know what uh, you're interested in and why you're interested in their particular program, and then you're also talking a little bit more about what you know you can contribute uh, to the program. And in yeah, so I think maybe I'm uh, wrong. Maybe I'm not remembering as much about what the like undergrad uh, application is like. But anyway, so uh, I ended up going to Columbia because I was really interested in kind of, I really liked the work that they did at the school. Um, and it overall uh, so far has been a very good fit for me. Um, so I think something else I wanted to say is that, for example, in terms of schools, uh, you know, just because a program has a very good undergrad architecture program doesn't mean it has a very good uh, graduate level architecture program. And that's another reason I, you know, rec I recommend doing a lot of research on these. And, um, and in terms of teaching style, Columbia, so our school is called uh, the Graduate School of um, Architecture, Planning and Preservation. So it's called GSAP. Um, and so GSAP is very experimental and it has a lot less of a top-down pedagogy, whereas Cornell and Harvard, um, they also have good graduate programs in architecture, but uh, they're much more traditional in a kind of, this is how you should do architecture kind of teaching education. And so um, I think finding out where you are in terms of that spectrum is helpful when going to grad school. Um, some schools also focus more on things like par parametric design using stuff like Grasshopper, which is a visual programming language, but we won't get too much into that. Um, 
and other programs focus more on model making and some are really focused on materials and mock-ups, et cetera. Uh, but Columbia GSAP is very, very focused on digital drawing skills. Um, although we do have a small making studio and we do spend some time on model making. Um, so I think the, these were just some examples of some of the work that I've done. Uh, this was designing a school in the um, East Village uh, and so this was also an adaptive reuse project where we had to kind of take an existing school building and, you know, put our own twist, reuse parts of it and then put our own twist to it. Um, and so for this project in particular, you know, these were some of the study models that I was doing to kind of explain my concept behind the school. Uh, and I was looking at this idea of a scissor stair. Um, and so we, you know, some of these models I got to make in our wood shop, and so there are some slightly dangerous tools that you have to learn how to use uh, in order to make them. Um, others, you know, you can cut by hand on your own. And so because our school is very, very focused on drawing, and also because of the pandemic that happened <laughs> uh, in the middle of my second semester, we transitioned mainly to doing a lot more drawings. Um, so this is one example of a type of drawing is called a section perspective where you cut um, through the building and kind of look in. Uh, and then plan drawing similar to my undergrad, um, but now focusing also on kind of the exterior details too. Um, and then we also had to learn how to do perspective drawings. And even though a lot of these can be uh, software generated, so these drawings were done uh, in a variety of software, for instance, uh, the, most of these were done in Rhino to begin with, and sometimes and in Rhino, which is often used in most architecture schools. Even though um, you can model stuff in it and do 3D, uh, we also had to do two-dimensional drawings as well. And so this used a combination of Rhino as well as um, Illustrator and then Photoshop on top of it. Um, so really using a larger suite of um, skills in order to make the uh, drawings. And so these also were, you know, started in Rhino um, and then eventually taken to another program for post-processing. Um, so this was a project I did in my first year that was for an architectural drawing course. Um, and so here we took an existing building that was, you know, already built by a famous architect. And this is House NA by Su Fujimoto and kind of putting our own spin to representing ideas. So I think that Columbia in general really makes you think about um, the drawings itself in the, in the sense that they say that draw, drawing is an argument um, and you know to be very, very deliberate about the drawings that you make. Um, and so this was a model that I did also that first year, um, which was laser cut and then um, kind of Piece, uh, using acrylic and other materials and kind of piecing it together to show a concept behind the building. Um, and so I think that, let's see, it's nice. It was really, it's been really nice going to Columbia because they really make us think about the argument behind our projects. Um, and we're also really pushed in terms of doing proper research and to support a design decision and in addition to you know thinking about things like form, we also think a lot about context, uh, different social issues, and current contemporary problems. And we always have to design projects that respond very well to um, specific uh, problems. And something that has differentiated grad school for me from undergrad, and in general, grad school will always probably be a bit more rigorous than undergrad, is that we're pushed to think beyond just what you know, a good building or good architecture is and to think about the possibilities for what architecture uh, can be. Um, and so it's been really wonderful in that sense. And it's also a very uh, critical uh, thinking heavy type of um, experience so far. And let's see, since going to Columbia, I've also gotten the chance to do some things like design competitions, which are a really fun way to uh, practice your design skills. So I encourage that everyone to do that while they're in school, because definitely when I was working um, 
I didn't have very much time to engage in any design competitions. Um, so I think that, let's see, I wanted to talk a little bit also about the accreditation process to become a licensed architect because um, it is a longer process. And if you start your architecture degree from when you're an undergrad, um, the, what is it called? I think it's the NAA NAB, NAAB accredited pro architecture program in the US for undergrads are typically five years. So just know that you would be going to school for an extra year in comparison um, to many other programs. There's also possible to get a four year undergrad in architecture, like a bachelor of science, um, as opposed to a bachelor of architecture. Um, but then what you typically have to do is, you know, go to grad school after. And although some people do uh, work instead, and it's possible to kind of figure out your way to licensure there. But in general, it's really, it's, I think, a straight, more straightforward path to becoming a licensed architect if you go to an NAAB accredited school. So whether that's a, you know, five-year undergrad degree, or you can get it in a graduate degree. So what I have is called, what I'm going to have is called an M Master of Architecture um, or an M Arc. And um, so after you, you know, graduate from that, you can work for a couple of years in an architecture firm and you have about five, I think it, it used to be seven back in the day, but I believe it's been cut down to five now, which just means that there's more material covered in each one of those exams. And each exam covers you know, different topics. Some look at things like code. I think one of them is very structural focused. Um, and so there's gonna be a lot of studying to do after you graduate and while you're working. And um, it, you know, it takes people a couple of years, I think, to finish all of the exams and to become a fully licensed architect. Um, and even though you can work, you can technically work in architecture forever, even if you don't have a, a license, but that just means that you have to work in another person's firm where they have to stamp the drawings um, because <laughs> it's, you know, it's all very, a lot of like legal things happening. Um, and it is a little bit more freedom if you do get licensed either in interior design or in architecture, because then you can have your own practice. Um, and it also typically in firms helps, uh, I think in terms of, you know, advancing upward, et cetera. Um, and so, that's just something to think about with these these two fields. Um, and so, Kitchen uh, mentioned a little bit about the summer workshop that I'm going to teach this summer. And uh, so, for interiors, um, I want to teach students about how to plan out um, a small space, a small interior space, i.e., a cafe, and think about the in experience inside the space as well as how to draw it. So, we'll talk about things like plans. Um, elevations, as well as the uh, different types of perspective drawings. And we'll mostly use, you know, these different analog techniques, but we might explore um, SketchUp as well, which is a free um, and easy online modeling tool. And we'll also, you know, look at things like materials and, um, you know, how to think about choosing furniture and finishes um, and also different, maybe potentially fun ways of representing a project. And then for um, architecture, we will, you know, probably we'll talk about similar things because there are many things that cross over, but we'll be focusing at looking at designing more through sketching and model making, um, especially model making because that's, you know, a very highly, I think, important skill in the architecture field. And um, especially once we get back into in person learning, you will do a bit more of this. Um, but uh, we'll talk, you know, a little bit about different types of mostly um, hand cut models because <laughs> due to, you know, technology limitations. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about things like structure and students will get to design a small project through iterative model making processes. So these are some, oh, this was a fun one that I found. So not all of these uh, projects or these models and drawings are mine. Some of them are mine, but most of them are not. Uh, so this is a fun one that I think Harvard did during, they turned their structures classes into 
uh, one where you have to make things out of spaghetti instead due to the pandemic. So, you know, there, even despite being in online learning, there's many ways to make uh, models. This was definitely done many years ago by another student in, in an in-person studio. So there's just uh, many possibilities with model making. Um, but since our <laughs> workshop will be one week, we will kind of focus on more simple model making techniques. And uh, so I guess I wanted to offer, I was thinking about what suggestions I would have for uh, students if they are interested in either interior design or architecture. And um, one thing in terms of the program and choosing which programs you're interested in is to look at the student work from the programs that you're interested in. A lot, nowadays, a lot of schools are posting student work on social media, even if they don't have it on their website readily available. Um, but I know that, um, well, our, my program in particular has a very active Instagram where you can see a lot of student work. Uh, and I'm sure that many other programs do too. Another suggestion I have is to, you know, just draw a lot. Uh, it's been really incredibly beneficial to me to be able to kind of draw my ideas and not necessarily, you know, the kind of drawings that are, that take forever to make, but, you know, quick sketches because uh, sketching is one of the fastest ways to really communicate your design ideas to someone else, especially your instructors or your colleagues. Um, so it's really important to be able to communicate that way. Uh, otherwise, you're stuck trying to explain it <laughs> in some other more long-winded verbal way. And But that said, in order to be able to complete a good project, you also have to be able to explain it to other people uh, verbally. So you know, in the field, we give, uh, we have to do, especially even in, in school, we have to do a lot of presentations. And then in the uh, real world, we also have to do quite a few client presentations to really get them to sign off on what type of project you're trying to um, design for them. And so I think learning different types of presentation skills is really helpful. I remember actually when I started at uh, many, many years ago, I guess it was 19, was it 19? Did you say 19? Because it made me realize that I feel old. But um, when I started uh, learning Chinese painting 19 years ago, I remember I didn't really talk at all. <laughs> and I was very scared of talking. Um, but to be an architect and to be an interior designer, you do have to talk a lot. Uh, yeah, I definitely present my projects a lot, I have to present in many classes a lot. Um, so luckily for me in high school, I did a speech and debate program that kind of forced me to do some more talking. And so now I'm a little bit more used to it. Uh, but anyway, so being able to explain your ideas and also to write down your ideas is really helpful, um, especially for your portfolio. And then something to know before going into design and architecture is that Sometimes the design and architecture professors can be very harsh critics and it's a very opinion heavy uh, occupation. So I think that when I was in school, I noticed that students who, you know, uh, didn't, who took the critiques personally uh, were probably less able to kind of handle this whole process um, in comparison to kind of students who didn't take the criticism so personally and they know that design is about uh, problem solving and it's not necessarily about you know expressing yourself so instead of taking the critiques personally it's really important to use them as learning opportunities for how you can be a better designer um, and also to recognize that everyone has a different opinion uh, so that's just something that will I think serve you better when you do go to school because uh, it it can be a lot of work and a lot of harsh or un sometimes nicer critics too. Um, and then it's also important to, I think that even if you, you know, do take criticism to recognize that, you know, or to be able to enjoy the work that you're doing and like your work, even while recognizing that you have room for improvement, um, because that makes the process more fun as well. And then lastly, I was, thinking about um, some advice I would give to students now is that a lot of students in the design world are procrastinators. Uh, so 
I, you know, it's hard to prevent that sometimes, but I would say, and, you know, everyone always says that architects and designers, especially in school, don't get any sleep, but I would recommend trying to get sleep by planning ahead for your project work and to, um, I've been lucky to never have to pull an all-nighter and to uh, mostly just work when I feel are good about the project direction. So, you know, when I have creative blocks and uh, when I just not enjoy my work, I step away from my project and do something else. So I think that is, uh, yeah, that's all my advice that I have. And I think that's the end of my presentation, but um, I'm happy to take some questions and I noticed there's a Q and A uh, coming up. Should I start yes. with the Q and A or? Uh, yes, Lucia. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, just like before you start with Q and A, you know, this is the first time that I that I, that I hear you talk so much. <laughs> yeah, Lucia is really really good. That she is. Yeah, and um, she is always very punctual. And then each time when I write her a message or something, she get back to me right away. She she doesn't have like procrastinating or something. She is, <laughs> she is you are very good at time management, and it's very important to be like in design field. Yeah. Okay. I right. remember when I was an undergrad, I actually had this rule that I set for myself where I would finish every project two days in advance, and even if you are late. You're at least on time because you can be up to two days late on your own deadline. Um, yeah. But uh, let's see, I think, okay, I got it. Uh, so I'll start with, um, I think, are you guys answering the question about the art portfolio and the design portfolio or should I answer it? Uh, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, uh, Lucia, you can answer it. Uh, for my interpretation, art portfolio and design portfolio basically is the same. It's just different different way that you call it. And it's all the uh, all portfolio depends on what kind of uh, design portfolio is going to be like uh, more design field and our portfolio is we also call it our portfolio design portfolio it's just different way of mm -hmm. yeah yeah i mean i think when you're applying to a degree or a program like an undergrad program or a grad program you know it's you just have to decide what work you want to put in um but typically I call it a design portfolio mostly because I have design work in my portfolio as opposed to art uh, now. And then the second question I see up here is um, Melody's asking how is math involved in um, you know the work that I do? And I would say that even if it's not always, well, one, you have to be able to calculate budget and things like that. Uh, but then sometimes you know we have to do different types of calculations related to um, geometry, et cetera, but, and geometry is really useful, I think, for an architect or a designer. Um, and then other times, um, for structure, uh, especially, even though, you know, we have structural engineers that we, you know, consult for more difficult structural issues, having a very good understanding of, you know, math, physics, structure is always really helpful. Um, let's see. The other the next question is when I applied for Cornell, did I have to submit a portfolio for my major? And the answer is yes, uh, I submitted um, what I guess we would call an art portfolio because I only had artwork back back then when I was, um, you know, 17 years old. Um, so yeah, you can just submit, you know, whatever artistic work that you do have. Some programs will ask you just, I think my program, the, uh, the Cornell program that I went to, uh, nowadays, for an application, you instead of submitting a portfolio, you have to complete like a design challenge. Um, that way, uh, they're kind of asking students like the same thing, and every student has to submit their own creative response to the uh, prompt. Let's see. Okay. Um, in architecture. Thank you for sharing your graduate um, experience in this area. Curious to know what the undergrad experience is like and what preparation he may need to have working toward his interest. Um, I would say that it's, you know, probably similar to interior design in the sense that um, preparing any type of creative portfolio is very helpful. Um, and 
I remember for when I was touring MIT, when I was looking at grad schools, one of the portfolios for someone who had gotten in the previous year was someone who was a physics uh, major. Uh, and I know this isn't about undergrad, but it, it, and but what they did was they found out how to kind of visually express some of their physics concepts um, instead of you know making other types of artwork. So I think that having any creative work in a portfolio is really helpful. And then the undergrad experience, I mean, it's probably similar to the grad experience in the sense that you know you have to do a studio class every semester, um, so that's many uh, hours of work. Uh, every week, all the time, um, but it's very fun. And um, what else? I think that the probably one of the difference for an undergrad degree is just that uh, there's more general classes. Uh, but I, I don't think undergrad is completely different from what I'm doing now. But it really just depends on the school that you go to. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, because uh, when Lucia started like uh, learning Chinese painting with me at that time, I haven't have like uh, our current school, HNR Academy. So we don't have like enough t at that time. I, I, I could not help her that much. And uh, right now we have all our whole program with the drawing, with the painting and with all kind of art. Yeah, and um, so just like uh, later we can like introduce about our summer program. That could be a big help when you are like building your portfolio. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm, All right. See. So the next question is, are there any college summer programs uh, that you recommend that is related to interior design or architecture? Um, well, we are <laughs> doing one. Well, oh no, sorry, college summer program. Uh, let's see. So I think many schools do offer one. I know Cornell offers one to uh, summer students every year. Columbia also offers one to high school students every year. Um, many, many different, um, you know, architecture schools do offer it. So I don't know about too many because I didn't attend one, but. Um, yeah, uh, one of our students, one of my students, Sheila, Sheila went to like a Cornell uh, architecture program in summer before. Yeah, mm. um, yeah, and then, uh, but she, and she tried to apply for, uh, no, <laughs> for, the architecture program in Cornell when she applied for college and she didn't get in, but she ended up in Berkeley architecture program. And mm -hmm. uh, I know that uh, Berkeley also have this kind of program also, and she teaches there also. Uh, today, I was originally going to invite Sheila also, but she was like totally booked <laughs> with her current job. But next time we're definitely going to invite her to be one of our speaker. Yeah, both Sheila and um, to see how they are fantastic. Yeah, and um, yeah, on the chat. Uh, uh, oh, there are two more questions on yeah. the Q&A, okay. should I? Yes, please. Um, so it says, how did you get interested in design? Is getting um, medals from art and competition, art competitions during high school, uh, does it tell people that you are strong in art and design or just taking four years of art classes is enough. Um, what if I can't get medals from an art kind of competition, but I still like art and design? I don't think that, you know, uh, you're required to, you know, win any types of art competitions to, it certainly, it could help a little bit, but I think at the time from my grad, my undergrad application, I had only listed, uh, what is it? The Chen Mei Guo. Uh, the U.S. competition, remember. U.S. art, Chinese painting yeah, competition. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, she actually like uh, win uh, many years. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I had only put, I think um, there was one year when I got two gold medals and that was like the main year that I did well. And then I think the other one that I like, I mean, I because I, I think I did, yeah. Um, but that, I only had put that one year uh, medals into my uh, application, but otherwise, you know, it's really about the portfolio typically for to show what your, uh, you know, your interest as well as your skill in art. Um, so I would say that, you know, even if, even if you don't happen to get a, a like specific awards that no matter what, even your personal artwork or et cetera, et cetera, is very 
useful and whatever you do in terms of it, the classes and the class work that you've done is going to be really helpful. Um, and then also for architecture, do you also need to take math or physics courses in college? Um, so I think that, I think it would vary depending on the school, but in order to apply to my grad program, I did need to take um, a college level math class as well as a college level uh, physics class in order to apply to grad school. Um, so that's something to keep in mind if you, if you, you know, decide not to do it in undergrad, but you want to do an architecture degree in grad school, uh, a lot of schools will require physics, um, an architecture history course, or even two architecture history courses before you apply. So there's a couple of prerequisites that vary depending on the school. Um, but a lot of, I think in Cornell's undergrad architecture program, instead of I think specifically teaching art, math and physics, I mean, uh, they taught two structural courses in which you, you know, you did a little bit of math and physics. Uh, so, you know, it's good to have an interest or at least somewhat of a skill for those. And then in the chat, um, I see one question that says, do you have to learn about materials to use in buildings? And that's true for both architecture and interior design. Um, right now, I'm actually taking a class called Healthier Building Materials, uh, just because there are a lot of materials that uh, exist in the, you know, in construction world that aren't necessarily healthy for people. So we're learning a lot about, you know, why that is and uh, just learning about what are better materials. And then in interiors, I would say even more so that um, you kind of have to know a lot about different materials. Um, you, a lot of rep, uh, like different companies will come to the, uh, to the firm that you're working in and try to like sell you on certain materials that they're making. Um, so yeah, so that's one thing. And then Another question is, did you have any specific focuses when submitting an art portfolio for your college portfolio due to a lack of an actual design content? Um, and I would say that uh, I think, you know, for me, I was very focused in my uh, portfolio application. Like I, you know, I just put whatever artwork that I did <laughs> into the portfolio. So I'm sure you could strengthen it by adding in design work um, and focused art architecture work as well. I think, you know, to show them that you are thinking about these types of issues, but um, even if you only have uh, different types of artwork, I think that's also sufficient to apply because um, it worked for me. <laughs> uh, let's see, okay, so what kinds of art did you put in your portfolio? Did you have um, mainly artistic or more technical pieces? So. I wish I could dig up my portfolios, but I don't know where it is. Um, but I most, so some of the uh, Chinese painting work that I showed at the beginning of the presentation, I put a lot of that in. Um, and it was, I think quite a few waterfalls. <laughs> I think my favorite <laughs> thing actually was to paint waterfalls and it's still one of my favorite things to paint mm -hmm. when I do paint nowadays. Uh, so it was, I guess you could say it's more artistic, um, but, um, mostly more uh, of the Chinese painting type of work. But, you know, I think that there is a very wide range that you can put into your portfolio when applying. Okay. Are there any other questions that I missed? Yeah, if someone wants to ask a question, you can raise your hand and then I will open it up for, you can ask question through voice, audio. Oh, okay. there's one. Uh, yeah, so, Mary. Yeah. Yeah. How about the career for architecture degree? Is it easy to find a job? Mm, I think that. Let's see. Um, I think that it is. It's not. You know, it's not necessarily on the easy side or the hard side, in the sense that it always varies depending on like like after the 2008 economic crisis. I know that a lot of people had to stop being architects and go do something else. So. Um, you know, it depends on the economic situation, but in general, everyone that I knew from undergrad uh, got a job eventually, you know, whether it was right upon graduation or right after graduation or a couple months after graduation, you know, everyone 
was able to find work uh, in interiors and architecture. And um, I mean, this year has been a strange year. So the people that I know who graduated last year, I think due to the pandemic, it was it was a little bit rough. But in general, there's mm, I would say it's actually easier to find a job than to find an internship, just because I think there are more full time um, jobs. So yeah, I don't know. I don't think that it's very difficult, but it's also not it's you know it's not easy in the sense that you you definitely do have to do work uh, in order to apply for those jobs. Yeah, Mary, you can speak now. You ask your question. Oh, that's my question. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lucia. Sure. Of course. Yes, and also like uh, because uh, when we see Lucia's work, uh, Lucia has a really she is really talented, and she has all this kind of like a drawing class, uh, drawing foundation. And in summer, we also uh, we only offer in summer, especially like uh, we uh, we offer a lot of workshops that's related to architecture as well. For example, perspective drawing. Okay, we have a couple of perspective, interior and exterior. And that is like especially for interior design or architecture students if they are interested. And also we have pen and ink. Okay, like uh, how to use pen and ink and also like quick sketch, watercolor quick sketch, all this kind of stuff. And also of, of course, Lucia is going to uh, give us the intro um, uh, architecture and also interior design. So uh, these are all the classes that you might be interested in if you are in interested in this field. Yeah. Okay. So anyone has any question? Yeah, you can just like go to our school website. Uh, Jason, do you want to take a very uh, show students how to? Sure, uh, I can quickly just show you where to find those information on our website. Just give me a second. Okay, for those parents who have never been to our school before, uh, the site you want to go to is eachandartacademy.com. Uh, when you are at the homepage, here is a summer art program and it's age-based. So what you want to look at is the 70 workshops, age 11 and up. So click on the learn more button. That will take you to the uh, this page that where we list all the uh, summer art workshops. And we organize our workshops. Actually, there are 70 of them. We will organize them based on six tracks, right? There are drawing and sketch track, um, color series, that's primarily oil painting, watercolor. And then we have illustration and digital, digital art and the art portfolio. And the, there's a career exploration. Lucia will be teaching this uh, introduction to architecture and uh, introduction to interior design. Right, you can find those information. And if you want to look at a specific topic, subject, or workshop, you can uh, click on this uh, link. That will show you the entire schedule for every week. Actually, for the entire 11 week uh, for during the summer, we got to, each week we have multiple workshops, right? There could be morning session, afternoon session, or evening session, right? So yeah, please take a look at that. and. Uh, the, uh, if you want an interest in a specific track, let's say, actually, in addition to what Yichen mentioned, uh, if you're interested in architecture design, there also we have 3D modeling class and also digital classes where you can learn all those uh, uh, Adobe, like a Photoshop or Maya for the 3D modeling, right? So, yeah, if, you, yeah, if you're interested in any of those courses you can, or workshops, you can look at it under that category and uh, look at the time and which week it's morning or afternoon. And if you want to see students are work, click on the learn more button button. And that would take you to the screen where we display last year's, right? The same workshop that's done by students. They are all done online. So yeah, feel free to explore uh, various uh, students are working. You can see what kind of things students will be able to do even for online classes. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's all the, yeah, where to find the information. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much, Lucia. And uh, yeah, thank you. I know that it's the final week and you're very busy. And I really, really appreciate that you come over and share your own experience with our students. Right. Very happy to. Thank you for having me. 
Thank you, Lucia. So uh, if there's no any question, uh, just like uh, we'll end our section right here. And tomorrow we have two more webinars. Like at three o'clock, we have a, a UI UX design. And uh, in the afternoon, like at five o'clock, we have fashion design. So if you're interested in any of those two fields, you can, it's still the, in, you still have enough time to sign, sign uh, to register for those webinars. All right. Okay. Thank you for everyone to be here. And thank you, Lucia, for being with us. So glad to see you again. Good to right. see you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Good night. Bye. Good night, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>